Hello and welcome to Simplify TV, the web series and podcast for agencies, brands, marketers, and media buyers. I'm David McBee. Our guest today is Brian Miller, president of Neptune Ops, widely recognized for deploying the latest in bleeding edge political technology in public affairs, candidate, and ballot measurement campaigns. Brian has served two U.S. presidents and has over 25 years of experience in public affairs. He began his political career on President Clinton's re-election campaign. He later served in the Obama administration as senior counsel at the U.S. Department of Energy. One of the country's leading political journalists wrote that under Brian's leadership, the industry's mastery of public relations and guerrilla tactics is awe-inspiring. Brian, welcome to Simplify TV. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm so grateful you're here. Now, I'd like to call out a line from your bio that I thought was pretty interesting. You're recognized for deploying the latest in bleeding edge political technology. That sounds amazing, but what exactly does that mean? Well, it's a series of tools. It's not one thing. And and it's probably best to start at kind of the high level of what makes political <clears throat> advertising different than some of the commercially focused advertising that a lot of the listeners might be more familiar with. And the way I always try to keep it straight in my head is in commercial advertising, most of what we're doing, we're targeting who I would call replaceable targets. If I'm trying to target somebody in my demographic, there's a lot of people like me in my demographic. And as an advertiser, you'll only spend so much resources trying to reach that person. And if it doesn't work, you move on to the next target. When we're dealing with political advertising, that is often not the case, particularly when we're in the public affairs aspect of it. And what we mean by public affairs is when we're trying to reach particular policymakers, like legislators, members of Congress, governors, those people are irreplaceable. We have to reach them essentially at all costs. And so really what the tools that we focus on the most are ones that are designed to be as narrowly targeted and specific as possible where we can reach those truly irreplaceable targets and reach them as many times as possible. So digital's ability to target a really niche audience is key for political campaigns. Is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. So how is, uh, how is digital advertising changing public policy and election outcomes overall? Uh, you know, I, th I think of public affairs advocacy as having gone through essentially three stages. Um, in the beginning, Everything was one-on-one, -on -one. everything was handshakes, it was traditional lobbying in the halls. And over time, that was supplemented by what I would call really selective paid media and insider publications. And then at some point before COVID, and then it was rapidly accelerated by COVID, we entered into the stage we're in now, where policymakers are surrounded by messages all day long digitally. So when the lobbyist leaves or when the client leaves the meeting, those policymakers continue to get an echo of those messages. And that has a huge impact on policy outcomes. It really changes the nature of the winners and losers. Um, it really levels the playing field, actually, in a lot of ways, because people can suddenly communicate at broader scale with policymakers and, and do it at much more, um, do it at much higher frequency than they were able to do before. So it's the people who are deploying those tactics the most who are really getting the edge in public advocacy. So with all that noise, what are the best tactics to get through? Yeah, it's noise, but but it's um, but it's delivering that noise in the most surgically targeted way, where you're reaching just your targets and their influencers, and not wasting um, those those critical ad dollars on people who are not necessarily in your target audience. So, what are the best tactics to use in? Yeah, so simplified tools are our key part of that for us. Um, we certainly uh, you know spend a lot of time with the latest in geofencing, which you guys excel at for sure. And you know that is one of the core blocking and tackling tools. You know, if I'm, if I'm trying to talk to just let's just say Gavin Newsom, there's only one Gavin Newsom, and I want to make sure that I've surrounded him in the most uh, most surgical way possible, as well as his influencers. And we use a combination of different programmatic tools to do that. It often starts with geofencing. It also gets into some of the cookie list solutions, um, but it also gets into you know some of the things that I would call supplementary, like. You know, programmatic audio is an interesting tool to um, talk to policymakers and influencers. And some of the PMPs, the private marketplace uh, deals that uh, you all enable to let us really be in insider publications at a really efficient way, have a huge impact on that. Um, you know, the, the identity resolution is a big part of this too. Um, when we're talking to, again, that you know, irreplaceable target, We've got to make sure we're reaching them on all the screens whenever 
they happen to be online. You know, we can't we can't take it for granted that we're just going to reach them on mobile or or CTV or um, you know whatever it is. We've got to make sure we're reaching them anytime they're online. And so having really good identity resolution coupled with the geofencing and the full suite of programmatic offerings, that to us is the heart of it. What about targeting at the individual address level? Does that play a part in political advertising? I think a lot of people in this space think in terms of like geofencing you know, capital buildings or geofencing like you know downtown areas around capitals. And there's a role for that for sure, but there's a lot of waste when you're doing that as well. You know, if, if you just I spend a lot of time in Sacramento or Capitol here in California, and I can tell you on any given day, there's a little, you know, a lot of middle schoolers on field trips there. <laughs> I've been in this major construction project going on for years at this point in the Capitol. So it's a lot of construction workers, so, um, you know, just a ton of people who are not necessarily in our target audience. So we do think there's a role for that. I'm happy to discuss what that role is, but we think it's more important actually to get to the home by home level as you're just alluding to with those policymakers and then maybe supplement that with some of the you know, commercial and government buildings. What about speed? Is it important for uh, a political campaign to have a quick response time from the campaign managers? Yeah, I spend a lot of time apologizing to your team for how everything is urgent and like last minute, despite everything I try to do to make that, um, you know, a little bit more manageable and it just doesn't seem to work. There's a lot of reasons for that that I'm, I'm not sure are particularly important to dwell on, but with the nature of politics is very much like a wait, 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 and then it's always an emergency. Um, it's driven by external deadlines. It's just driven by different incentives in the commercial space. Often, um, you know, votes are happening in a capital that we get like essentially no notice on and things have to be done, you know, very urgently or something changes very quickly on a bill that we were kind of, you know, uh, watching and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden a last minute amendment comes in and it's going to be voted on tomorrow. And uh, so speed has a, has a different meaning, I think, in the political space than it does in the commercial space. Everything is essentially turbocharged. And um, of course, you guys excel at that. And uh, I'd, I'd call out specific members of your team, but I don't want to embarrass them. But. <laughs> I love that. I guess if you're selling macaroni and cheese, uh, you know, speed is not the most important part of a campaign. But uh, when there's a vote happening tomorrow, it definitely is. No insult to macaroni and cheese. If you're really hungry and you've got a hankering for macaroni and cheese, I get the importance of it. It's just uh, there's maybe something besides macaroni and cheese you can eat too um you know you could, you could eat spaghetti and meatballs and we just don't have that luxury in politics so yeah everything tends to be urgent and irreplaceable targets which which makes for a sort of harrowing combination at times what are some of the other best practices or maybe just some advice you have for other political advertisers that uh that that aren't unfamiliar with programmatic and the role that it plays in campaigns I think it, one of the interesting things about politics is, um, and certainly the gap we try to fill, innovation and the, the things that you all work on every day and you talk about on the show, that, that innovation is actually really slow to come to politics. And um, you know, there's there's a few reasons for that. I <clears throat> think about this issue a lot. Uh, there's I think there's certainly cultural reasons for it. I also think we have some distorted incentives in the political space. Um, but but one analogy I like to think about is <clears throat> if you think about a typical commercial sales cycle, you know it's actually pretty quick and you get really rapid feedback. I mean, you d you deal with big box retailers who make intraday changes to their advertising strategy based on foot traffic they're seeing. So it's just like a very rapid feedback loop. There's different levels of that along the space in in the commercial sector. Compare that to a political sales cycle, if you will, in quotes. And that might be every four years for a candidate, or every six years if you're in the United States Senator. And at the end of it, if you won, you don't tend to do a lot of introspection as to what worked. And if you lost, you may be out of the business entirely. And you also don't tend to do a lot of introspection. So you don't get that like feedback loop that we get in the commercial space. And it's one of the reasons I think it's so valuable to like focus on the, the lessons from the commercial sector. Because I think you get that um, that feedback loop in there for the innovation much faster, and we can go a lot better in the political space when we kind of take the lessons from the commercial space and bring them over. All right, this might be a bit of a reach, but are you saying that a DSP that deals with commercial entities as well as political might have a a bit of a a value add as opposed to a DMP that only does political? 
not an overreach at all. I think it's absolutely crucial. And I'm like, personally, I'm much more interested in what happens in the commercial space than what happens in the political space, because I really do think that's where the innovation comes from. You know, I live and work in Silicon Valley and, um, you know, just, just, you know, the way we came to the space is I was actually out here running the solar industry's advocacy. And I found myself completely outgunned, fighting much bigger opponents that could outspend us in the political process by orders of magnitude. And I was looking for ways to stretch advocacy dollars. And I saw my solar company at the time doing these amazing things with ad tech that I never heard before in the political space and started to wonder if we could adapt those tools to the political space. And, and that's what we did. Did it with tremendous success across the country and ultimately started Neptune to, to build out those tools. And I continue to find that the innovation comes from what happens in the commercial ad tech space <clears throat> for some of the reasons we've discussed and, and, and some of the others. I don't want to call Washington and Sacramento stodgy, but I guess I just did. And so like these, these things are just a harder thing sometimes to adapt or adopt, I should say, in those places. Um, and so we just get a lot of really interesting conversations when we talk to people about those things because it's, um, it's often tactics, strategies, tools that people haven't heard about before in the political space. All right, uh, last topic, uh, streaming television, CTV. What role does it play in your world? I think it changes everything in politics, and I think this is rarely understood. I appreciate you asking that. Um, so when you think about it, let's just take a typical congressional district. The way a congressional district is drawn has uh, zero correlation to how cable lines are laid out in a neighborhood, okay? And so, you know, you, you see some just stunning amounts of waste in traditional television advertising in the political space. There was one study done by a major national super PAC after the last cycle. They said 75% of spending in competitive congressional races went to voters outside of the districts. Think about that. 75%. Like, imagine, like, you're a hardworking candidate and you're, like, on the rubber chicken circuit every night, you know, begging everyone you know for money and you lose three out of every four checks. That's the equivalent of that when you're advertising people outside of your district. But that's what happens when you do traditional advertising, your traditional TV advertising, I should say. You're forced to do that because, again, those cable zones or those broad, certain broadcast zones bear no correlation whatsoever to uh, political boundaries. And CTV means you don't have to do that anymore. You go home by home, voter by voter, also do differentiated messaging, talk to only people who you expect to vote, and talk to them in really tailored ways. And so this, this is, um, I think, just now beginning to, to be adapted at scale um, in the political space, but still the vast majority of money in political advertising goes to traditional TV. Um, and I just, I just can't think of a more inefficient use of, of a campaign dollar. So, so to me, I, you know, I, I essentially like see very little role for, for, for traditional television in the political space these days. And I also just give you, a, you know, an, another subset of that. When we talk about the public affairs issues, meaning targeting policymakers as opposed to voters, I mean, using traditional TV to that is essentially the height of madness, right? If, I, if I'm trying to talk to one particular legislature, and I'm going to buy, you know, broadcast TV or a cable zone. It means I'm advertising to millions of people, not in my, not in my reach. But if I can do it on a home by home basis through CTV, it completely changes the way I think about the use of television advertising and, and public affairs. Those are some fantastic insights, and I'm glad you brought that up because I actually live uh, in Kansas City. I'm on the Kansas side of the state line, but I'm constantly by, bombarded by those Missouri. Uh, politicians and, and their ad dollars. So maybe this will be good for the, the consumer as well. well. We'll have to see fewer ads if they're more targeted. Yeah, I love that example. I'll give you my favorite uh, worst story from this. So there was a very expensive Los Angeles mayor's race a couple of years ago. I won't, I won't name the candidates because I don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, and we had a colleague who, to be clear, does not live in Los Angeles, clearly was not meant to be in the target zone. And he happened to be in Guadalajara, Mexico, different country to so just put a fine point on that and got an ad in this Los Angeles mayor's race while he was in Guadalajara. And, and this is a voter <clears throat> from the Bay area who was in another country and it was on CNN, Espanol in, in Guadalajara. And I just think to myself, my goodness, like how do smart people waste ad dollars? Like, I, you know, I love your example. Your example happens all the time, of course, across the country. We, we hear this one in the D.C. area a lot where, you know, Virginia and Maryland candidates are sending each other's ads, which is kind of kind of nonsensical. 
but it even it even goes beyond countries' borders, and um, you know that's not a good way to spend dollars for smart people. Definitely not. Well, this has been very insightful. I'm so grateful that you were here. I do like to ask all of my guests before I let them go if they have a favorite podcast or a book that they feel has influenced their success in some way. Just, I, I've got lots of favorite podcasts. I am a podcast mainliner, um, but but let me take the book one, unless you want to give me two bites at the apple. And the, and the book for me is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, which is a very ancient philosophy book that I think holds true more today than ever before. And, uh, and you know, in the, in the podcast space, I would say Simplify TV, a great podcast where we should listen to. It. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Brian, what is the best way for viewers to learn more about you? Uh, they can go to our website, which is neptuneops.com. And feel free to just email me anytime personally. It's miller at neptuneops.com. Perfect. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you guys for watching. Simplify TV is sponsored by Simplify, helping you to maximize relevance and multiply results with our industry-leading media buying and workflow solutions. For more information, visit simply.fi. Thanks for joining us today. I'm David McBee. Be awesome, and we'll see you next time.